the original title was Mindstreaming RRI in the ERA with our two speakers that I said, but indeed we will more in depth uh, uh, enlarge the concept and starting from the pathways declaration, work on how to make RRI work locally. So we will try to discuss with Alan and Alex about the culture change journey of institutional implementation, giving contribution from more than 10 SWAPS projects that sign together the pathways to transformation declaration. Is that correct, Alan Marie? Yeah, you, uh, Alex is uh, the main uh, organizer here, so, but it sounds correct to me, uh, Alex. Okay. We can start or? We have to wait for him for this panel. Uh, okay. He's here, but okay. here. Okay, great. So I give you the floor to you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry, I had to follow the link uh, sent by Twitter because the others somehow didn't work. Uh, so I'm just setting myself up here. <clears throat> how many okay. colleagues? How many colleagues have joined? We are fifteen at the moment. Fifteen. Okay. Um, so the others don't seem to have had the same problems as I have. We can assume that then everyone else has their links, I guess. Okay. So give me a second to set everything else up. Um, I'm sharing my slides, I suppose, technically. Yes, Alex, you... you... Okay. Um, I think I'll need the administration rights first yet. There, there should be a green button. Yes, share in the middle, button. on the in the bottom. Yeah, you are you are a co-guest. I can see this from the from the participant list. Okay, great. Literally became green just now. <laughs> I don't know, technology is not with me today, but we shouldn't be technophobe, I suppose, um, in dealing with this issue. Okay, um, everyone, if everyone's ready, then I think I'd uh, like to, first of all, welcome everyone. Uh, Adam, Marie, and I are going to keep it rather short in terms of our inputs. And um, we wanted to make this, how do we call it, an e-engagement workshop, or anyway, a highly participatory, engaging workshops where we work with you and co-create with you um, the ideas and outputs. Um, the plan would be to basically do four things. That's why there are three bullet points. No, just kidding. Uh, first of all, uh, to start from a perspective which most of us know, which, are, uh, which is the project perspective. Um, we agreed that I would do that um, with a project that we recently finished, which I think was the largest RI project um, in uh, quite some time, the Nucleus project. But I keep that very short then um, to embark on that cross project initiative, which has already been mentioned just now, the Pathways uh, Initiative from 2019, um, which is the, uh, what the title says, um, uh, fulfilling the promise of discussing about culture change as a journey for institutions to implement it. And then we want to not stop where we are, but we want to look ahead as to the next framework program and um, look for some RA culture in it. Um, and as already discussed just with René and um, Lyndon, um, we are not entirely convinced yet that this culture is mainstreamed through the next framework program. So that's the plan for the next three steps. And then the fourth is the main discussion with everyone of, um, from your side. Please don't hesitate to already collect questions while we're presenting. We're keeping it short anyway. And um, I'm very much looking forward to the discussion then. Are there any immediate questions about the plan to go ahead with the session like that? What the order, any technical issues so far um, I'm, I should be aware of? <laughs> Doesn't seem to be the case. Okay, and I just go ahead, yeah? Yes, I think everything okay. is working, yes. Great, well, that's, that's a relief this morning. 
Okay, just briefly, um, Nucleus project, uh, 4 million euros for four years. It was a global one. It also included um, uh, partners from South Africa. And I've just seen actually um, a colleague from South Africa from NRF joining this session, um, also from China. The main four learnings from the project perspective were that uh, RI is very much about the quality of the process, much more than the activities or the results, which also reflects a lot, I think, the keynotes or the, the um, kickoff discussion this morning, that institutional change is not when you employ a public engagement officer. Institutional change is not if suddenly university has a gender equality plan, but otherwise doesn't live up to the plan and so on. The second learning that context sensitivity is absolutely fundamental to basically a process in context that we always should see as the idea of a civic university, for instance, the institution as part of a cultural environment, both when it comes to the institutional, cultural and disciplinary um, nature of it. Third learning is that there are significant resistances in the actual governance of research performing organizations when it comes to what we call culture change. Um, and also resistances on the side of research funding organizations and policy makers. So I do share um, the, uh, the hopes and the aspirations and the optimism expressed in this morning's session. I do not share um, the perception that we're, we're halfway there. Living RI as we try to do it in the project was to implement it across the world in 30 different um, what we call embedded and mobile nuclei to implement it and then to monitor and evaluate the actual change processes um, uh, also in terms of those four dimensions. We developed a policy brief as almost every project in SWOFs uh, in the RI domain I believe has done. Um, we produced some case studies booklets, so we showed how implementation works uh, in individual cases. Um, and you can read a couple of those points here. I don't think I'll have to take you through those in detail, also in the interest of time and starting late, because um, the aspiration uh, of this session today would be how do we get beyond the perspective of let's do something within one single project with five or 10 or 15 institutions, because in the end we're talking about how do we mainstream this across the entire European Union uh, and the research and innovation systems or even globally? This understanding led to a co um, collaboration between two projects which uh, now have also both been mentioned so far. The RI practice project um, uh, represented, for example, by Ellen Marie as a project coordinator, but she also mentioned it in her keynote recently, yesterday I think it was. And uh, the nucleus project, the two of us teamed up and we managed to together 11 other projects. So it's not 10, but 11. Uh, sorry for that in the title. So <laughs> 13 in total projects that uh, thought, what are our individual recommendations and how can we bring all of that together as a recommendation to the European Commission saying, if you really want this to be mainstream, if you want this to be a phenomenon, something that changes research and innovation from within, then we need to go a step further. We may need to make the next step. So we signed what we called a declaration on pathways to transformation, and that is a transformation of the systems, the very systems of research and innovation. That was endorsed, endorsed not just by the project beneficiaries, which if you want is natural because they are literally benefiting um, from that funding, but it was also endorsed from st by stakeholder organizations. In the event we held in summer 2019, for example, we had the European Universities Association there. We had a store there, so also the parliamentary side of things, science policy. That was, I think, a very crucial moment when it went beyond the SWAFs community and even beyond the scientific community. Um, there are a couple of follow-up projects, for example, Ring and Grip, two uh, projects in which I'm involved, which are also co-signatories here um, from the next funding period that basically are trying to implement and show that implementation based on the previous learnings from all those projects listed here and from the ones I mentioned in the declaration is possible and doable. We put all of that into a journal paper which I can recommend the slides, I believe, are going to be shared. And then you can actually click on the link, which you can't do now, but I'm, I'm happy to also share the link in a minute in the chat um, so that uh, there is a paper now out in the Journal of uh, Responsible Innovation 
summarize that. Let me just very briefly take you through the seven main claims of the declaration, which we think summarizes the challenges and the opportunities for implementing this actual institutional culture change um, in, uh, uh, in research institutions, research performing institutions. I took a few notes here and let me quickly look at those uh, because I wanted to also connect um, can you actually still see my slides if I look at my notes? I hope that works. Yes, we can see your slides. Okay, thank you. Because um, I'm maneuvering here between different windows. Uh, thank you for the feedback. Uh, Ellen also pointed in, in her keynote to new institutional theory, which might be something that helps, again, to connect that with what the declaration was trying to do. Because it for not forces, it encourages us to see to view a research performing organization in three different ways, as a set of structures, as a culturally unique body, and then of course also with its different degrees of openness towards the stakeholders. And whereas, again, the European Commission is quite confident in saying that, for example, in the SWOFs evaluation of the report, uh, it, it says that more than 200 individual institutional changes or change actions actually apparently happened across all those projects, which sounds amazing, like 238 universities and research institutes, which apparently went through a culture change process. But then the question that also, I think the, the declaration was trying to raise is whether we have the measurability, whether we have the comparability for um, that for the institutional change. So whether we know whether that actually happened, how many of these more than 200 changes are substantial? How many of those are sustainable? How many of those are sustainable in terms of structures and cultures and openness? Um, my personal estimate would be maybe 10%, but that's maybe also too pessimistic and I'm happy to discuss it with the group in a couple of minutes. So let me br briefly take you through the seven points. Um, First of all, RI needs to be embedded in the next framework program. That was the primary objective of this. So we, we've, we have, we've had this learning process. Where do we go from here? It means that individual approaches need to be um, tailored to the projects. They just be, it needs to be budget reserved to it, which um, uh, I would also be skeptical whether that's what's happened. And uh, we need to communicate guidelines and train the evaluators applicants and the reviewers because just uh, saying that this is now an objective or saying that there's a social mission, um, a social objective as um, René just framed it. The question is whether that is sufficient if we don't change the system of how proposals are evaluated, if we don't um, alter the perspectives of reviewers assessing whether RI is actually included in the proposal to a sufficient extent, if we don't offer trainings and capacity building for applicants and for research performing organizations to actually do what it is that they're promising in their proposals. Um, before I forget, by the way, to mention uh, we're using these seven slides here, uh, courtesy of our dear colleague Stephanie Daimer from Fraunhofer Easy in Karlsruhe. And the visuals here are from Heiko Stöber, who developed them as part of the New Horizon Envisioning Conference in 2017. So just that, um, the references are made. Second point, a bit, bit faster, the challenge of interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. Um, again, I don't think I have to explain it to the people I see in the list of participants here. You can also read up on it in the declaration in detail. We reminded the commission that we need to treat RI components as research, as, as not as an appendix, as a public engagement activity, but it's supposed to change a very research approach methodologically, conceptually, philosophically. The fourth point was that we need to be, that's where the process dimensions come in, which have been mentioned just now from um, by, by previous speakers. We need to anticipate, respond, reflect, and include. And the, particularly those reflective and inclusive and open dimensions shouldn't be fragmented. You shouldn't just be able to cherry pick one and forget about all the others. RI is a package deal, and that's how it should be applied. Open science, citizen science, and co-creation are aspects of RI. That's a very tricky discussion, as you may have noticed in the, uh, in the last hour, that um, there is an assumption that open science can simply replace the RI dimensions. 
I think um, that the SDS community would be skeptical whether that's immediately the case, particularly because open science has an output focus, at least is perceived as focusing on the output, whereas RI is very much about the input and the process perspective. So um, yes, it is part of that, but we have to be careful also with how the perceptions of different terms and concepts in the community might distort what the commission uh, is expecting with its policy prescriptions. We suggested an actual hub, so literally an institution supporting institutions um, in doing RI, in living RI. Lyndon mentioned that um, briefly, that he could also imagine something like a mentoring process or a mechanism where institutions are taken by the hand and encouraged and supported in doing what we are expecting of them. And the seventh point was um, about APs and communities, um, like societal sounding boards, if you want to include RI experts or and or transdisciplinary representatives in the advisory and governing bodies of emerging technologies and mission oriented programs, that would mean that we have the NGOs, the CSOs and the SDS experts on board of the committees who actually make the program decisions and contribute and co-create the proposals. Yet another thing that to my uh, understanding is not really the case. We see then the CSOs being brought on board as unpaid members of an advisory board. That to me does not check at all the box of integrating and living RI in the next framework program. Um, I hope that wasn't too long. Let me look at the clock. Okay, well, we started late, so I suppose that was just about on, uh, on time. Ellen, I would then like to hand over to you. We wanted to look for an RI culture in Horizon Europe. Uh, I could either stop sharing and you start sharing yours, or I could click for you, whatever you want. Yeah, um, okay. Uh, well, why don't I share so it's easier to... Uh, okay, give me a second. To... I think I've stopped sharing. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Um, yeah. So, good, uh, Alex. Uh, it's nice to take us through the history and now I will try to say something about uh, where I, what I perceive as the current status um, on, on what has happened and uh, to connect it to the culture building topic, uh, you could ask whether, and I'm being a bit specific here, the DGR and I has succeeded in building a culture for our in Horizon Europe. So um, let's see. Um, this is um, what I'm presenting now is a result of a, a lobby project funded by the Research Council of Norway. I, I'm not sure if they call it a lobby project, but it's a project that uh, is supposed to support uh, the implementation of topics uh, or research fields or research approaches that are important for Norway in Horizon Europe. And uh, the Research Council of Norway is very committed to RRI and they want to support the implementation of RRI in, in Horizon Europe. So um, we are basically three main team members uh, in this project. It's uh, Alex and uh, Siri Granum Karsson from the Norwegian Technical University and myself. We have our web page as well. You can have a look if you want. Um, basically, we're trying to influence uh, through while getting information, trying to um, uh, keep updated on what's going on, try to talk with our national uh, merit committees, um, the ones that actually give national input to the Horizon Europe, and also to work with program officers, um, people who write the draft texts, and also applicants and research communities. So let me get to the point. Um, as Rene and Linden has explained already, I don't need to say much about that. There is a legal basis for RI in, in Horizon Europe, and, and that's great. And it makes it it makes the argumentation a bit easier because we can we can refer to that uh, Horizon Europe sh shall do responsible research and innovation. Um, so. In the current version of the strategic plan for Horizon Europe, the overall policy document outlining the program, 
it's not as visible as the legal basis might say, but it's it's still uh, quite. Um, I th I think I agree with Renee and Linda that a lot of the perspectives are there, um, but they could say or arrive more. So they say like that uh, the document presents a range of horizontal considerations related to areas for in international cooperation and key specific issues of gender, social science, humanities, integration, key enabling technologies, ethics, open science, and social innovation. And uh, I just wonder why they can, why couldn't they say RRI? <laughs> it's not what is, uh, yeah, it, it would fit in well, uh, but it's not in there. Uh, also in the overall strategic plan, there is, uh, well, there are kind of different uh, strategic orientations. And uh, one of the strategic orientations for the strategic plan is uh, creating a more resilient, inclusive and democratic European society, prepared and responsive to threats and disasters, addressing inequalities and providing high quality healthcare and empowering all citizens to act in the green and digital transition. And uh, I think it would be, it, this kind of gives a mandate for including RRI um, in, as a part of, of this point D, but also to include it specifically in cluster two, which is uh, the cluster on, uh, oh, I have too many documents here. It's a cluster on um, uh, culture, creativity and, um, an inclusive society. So what we see is that there is mention of RRI in the draft documents now, but as far as I can see, there are no mentions of research on RRI. So RRI is seen as kind of a support approach, but uh, it should as well. And also according to the Pathways Declaration, there must be some sort of ability to also conduct research on RRI. Otherwise we won't have kind of the best possible research-based support for, for RRI in the rise of Europe. And that should be in the, in the cluster two perhaps. So just to give a, an example or a picture of how Horizon Europe looks, this is the overall structure. And uh, RRI, the home of RRI is now in widening and strengthening. So that's kind of cross-cutting the pillars. And of course, the, the money is in the, is in the pillars. Um, and the, the missions are in pillar two uh, uh, alongside the clusters. Um, so widening and strengthening is uh, the home for making sure that the whole of Europe is uh, engaged in research and innovation of high quality and also for reforming and enhancing, so strengthening the European research system in different ways. And I'm sure that Renee will um, correct me if I'm saying something wrong afterwards. So widening and strengthening is kind of where you will find most of our right together with open science and ethics. Um, and it says that again, the visibility of RI is not very high. It's the draft document for widening and strengthening says that it should be, it should empower European, Europe citizens as scientific knowledge is broadly diffused, forging critical thinking, social and democratic engagement, uh, more inclusive democratic societies, empowering citizens. And again, why couldn't, we, couldn't, we, couldn't they just mention RI? I think also a problem with our, our having our and widening and strengthening is that I, from my experience, there is a lot of focus on the widening countries. So how to get, you know, Eastern, well, many of them are Eastern countries uh, to, um, to uh, engage more in research and the cross-cutting issues are not equal. There's not equal uh, amount of attention to these. So that's, uh, I'm, I'm the pros and cons of having RRI in widening and strengthening. But as I said, there is, as far as I can say, see, not, not really research actions at all on RRI and widening and strengthening, not so far as at least. Um, <clears throat> but RRI is in there uh, and they have, it's a uh, section two called an open, inclusive and responsible research and innovation system, which is great. 
There's a lot of si focus on open science, open access, gender, citizen science, science communication ethics, so the well-known keys. But there is uh, also mention of, of RI. And there are coordination and support actions. So from the very excellent interview in the morning, <clears throat> we heard a lot about RI and open science. And um, I would like to point out that I'm not sure who in the European Commission takes this view, but at least it's, um, when we have called for more RRI in Horizon Europe, uh, an answer from the Commission has been to connect it to ethics. Um, so I think that's also something I'd like to hear Renee's views on. So that RRI is not really taken care of by citizen science or open science, but by ethics and integrity. So here's a quote. Um, RRI has been operationally defined as including several thematic keys, ethics being one of them. Responsibility in design, implementation, and communication of research is indeed a key in the research ethics and integrity policy objectives, and is covered by the following four principles of the European Code of Conduct for Research Integrity, a reference document in the Horizon Europe regulation. And then they, they quote these four principles, reliability, honesty, respect for colleagues, research participants, society, ecosystems, cultural her heritage and the environment, and um, finally accountability for the research from idea to publication, for its management and organization, for training, supervision, mentoring, and impact. And they say these values essentially based on the protection of the fundamental rights and the respect for the environment frame the responsible and ethical conduct of research. So from the, boy, the impression I get is that RI is now taken care of by research ethics. And, um, and there is more about research ethics also in the draft uh, uh, for the strategic plan of Horizon Europe, as mentioned under the section specific issues. Um, and one of the specific issues that will be taken into account is ethics and integrity. And they formulate it in a wider way than what we have usually seen the last years with, with regard to ethics and integrity. So it's not only anymore about research internal norms, but including norms related to the practice and impact of research. So in a sense, I would agree that when they expand the ethics, research ethics concept in this way, it, it gets closer to RI. Um, and I think that in order to make sure that the European Commission still communicates that RI is important, they could simply say ethics and, and responsibility. But this is not done. I think it's interesting and we should discuss whether we believe that an extended research ethics approach would cover a lot of the concerns we have about our eye. Another thing about this specific part of the draft strategic plan is, um, is that it doesn't really say how these specific issues will be taken into account. What it does it mean to take something into account? Will it be up to each program line, how it will be implemented, with how will it be monitored, evaluated, and, and followed up. So that's an important point. And then I would just like to say a little bit about European Innovation Council. I mentioned it as a question in the chat, and uh, Rene answered uh, very kindly. Um, it is quite, I mean, if you read the document, it's all about groundbreaking radical research that is going to have this uh, dramatic um, uh, uh, impact on, on our societies. That's what they want, high-risk research, uh, potentially kind of turning around everything in order to, well, I suppose, solve uh, or societal problems. But there's hardly any mention that it doesn't only have to be high, it, they can't only be high risk, it has to be responsible risk. Um, so all of these uh, change, radical, groundbreaking changes are supposed to happen without any of the, what we're used to with, you know, societal engagement and responsibility and all of that. So for me, it was like going back 20 years when I read it. <clears throat> There's hardly anything about social engagement. There's engagement with stakeholders like industry. Um, but 
when with the kind of ambitions that the European Innovation Council has, it, society must be involved. And when you read, there's there are some kind of specific challenges that they call pathfinder challenges, that, which are supposed to kind of guide uh, at least some of the research. Um, and they are, um, if they seem to be technology pushed and not defined by identified societal needs. And these challenges should be identified in a broad inclusive process. And in addition, several of the ones that are mentioned so far are highly ethically sensitive. For instance, um, self-developing in the wear artificial systems, engineered living materials. For me, it's very strange that they don't um, address the need for uh, handling this in a responsible research and innovation approach. So I think this is the most kind of um, worrying part. Um, so I think that I'm going to, I'm very rude now, I'm going to do a kind of an assessment. I think, yes, I mean, there's so much good work uh, done in Horizon Europe, also by people who've been here today. It's great that it's in the overall objectives. There is inclusion in widening and strengthening, and we feared that there wouldn't be any, and there is some. Um, it is mostly translated into open science and ethics. The missions, I would agree, reflect the RI spirit, but it's not only about RIs, maybe just as much as about the sustainable development goals. I would agree that there is overall more involvement of citizens, more interdisciplinarity and stronger requirements of openness in many places in the horizon. So I, I think that in a way it's a success. I think with regard to the innovation people, the European Innovation Council, there, yeah, it's so far a failure. And I think that we have to take part of the blame. Why, how, what could we have done to, to build a better understanding of our RI and the innovation community? And we as our RI community haven't, haven't done that. Um, so I think there is still time because the processes are not completely closed. And if you get in touch with me, I can, I, can have some more information about how you can engage and I, we basically need everyone to engage also like it was said earlier um, so but I have um, I would like to finish by a few very concrete questions also based on the interview earlier today um, because I think that Renee said you said that we would need to influence the applicants to European Innovation Council, but, um, and that's fine in a sense, but I think there should always also be a way to get in touch and try to influence the staff actually um, making, writing the texts because applicants will do what is um, required in the text. So for me, it would be also, uh, you know, very urgent to get in touch with the e EIC staff. Um, I'm not sure how we can influence the applicants. I don't see what I can do to do it, except only like kind of open invitations. And, and the same problem I have with the missions. Uh, I understand that we have a great opportunity and a window of opportunity for the missions now, but how to reach, reach them, how to influence them. Um, I think one, like you, you or Lyndon was saying that he was a bit worried that we didn't have enough capacity for all of this that was going to happen in Horizon Europe. And one of the things we wanted in the Pathways Declaration was a RRI hub, and it's not there. And uh, I really hope it's possible somehow to get a tender for a, a, an RRI hub in widening and strengthening. Um, but I don't know how to achieve that. And finally, it is a problem, I think, that there is so far no possibility to do research on RI, as far as I can see. So I hope I didn't provoke too much, but uh, I hope that uh, this was at least enough for uh, Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ellen. I think provocation was our job. That's, that's, that was the job description this morning. And I can only underline it, and I think that's also where both of us have tried to emphasize that it needs, it would need, conditional a specification of those dimensions of responsibility in the work programs, be it the EIC, 
or uh, Horizon Europe, because otherwise it remains an abstract paradigm or policy prescription. So how is it actually broken down into specific requirements that also the applicants understand and where the, where's the resource base that they can touch and say, okay, then that means I need this module or, or that framework. So that would be the one dimension. I think the other one, Ellen, that you just touched upon was where's the actual practical support for RPOs and also RFOs by the RI community? Uh, where's the mechanism? Is it this, this hub, for example, that we envis envisage? What's the interface? How can we make sure that there is a knowledge transfer from all of the things that we have apparently learned from SWAS into um, the programs? We have one question in the chat. I was wondering whether we should directly jump to that one. Yeah, and we can. Yeah. Probably, uh, Ellen, if you can stop sharing so that we can okay. see each other. Great. <laughs> Here we are. I, ha I have Lu Lucy Patrizia Onundo. Um, okay, which is for you, so I cannot see it. Great. Oh, oh, oh. oh okay, it's only uh, to me privately. I hope I'm allowed to read it. Okay. If not, stop me in the next five seconds. Fair enough, that was informed consent. Uh, the scientist must be smart to drive decision making on policies. Did someone just interrupt me? No? Okay. The scientist must be smart to drive decision making and policy. The hub, probably the one that we just talked about, and meet the expert strategies are crucial. How will these be implemented? And someone's trying to say something. I'll stop talking for a minute. Did anyone want to say something? No, no, no. Okay. Um, so Lucy, I, I just read out your question. If you're still with us, let's see. Yeah, she's here. She's here. Would you would you mind would you mind expanding a bit from that point? Lucy, por favor. Lucy, I can see Lucy among the participants. I don't know if she, okay. Here she is. Hi, Lucy. You have to unmute your microphone. Okay. Okay, these are great insights that uh, I've captured eh, from uh, this trans transaction. And uh, it involves governance, it involves power. And uh, now here is the scientist who has not been equipped with the tools all the methodologies to be able to convince or influence so that uh, like in Africa, be able to establish the foundations uh, whereby we are going to project towards uh, responsible uh, research and innovation. Because like our foundations are vulnerable. Actually, when I was listening to all these, I was, I was looking at the foundations, our educational foundations, uh, from uh, a primary school, even the universities are highly compromised. So the kind of research that we are doing uh, is uh, actually based on output and not really the outcome. And uh, it has really triggered a lot of brainstorming in my mind. So I would really want to know, uh, so how can the scientists uh, be able to get smart in terms of convincing, in terms of influencing and driving even decision making? Because I think we have been, uh, we have been shy in that line as scientists. Am I clear now? Even clearer than before. Thank you very much for the question. Yeah. Um, Alan, ladies first, do you want to start? Um, no, I think that was mainly a question for you, Alex. Okay, no, I'm happy to start. I just wanted to at least ask. Um, but Lucy, I think it's very much a policy question and maybe not so much a capacity building question in the scientific community. Of course, if you had the right tools and, and arguments and so on, and uh, again, uh, for example, our colleague from the National Research Foundation in South Africa is with us at the moment, 
They were part of the project I mentioned in the beginning. So there are frameworks, there are tools, there are processes, there are ways to go about this, also to approach your own executive board, for example, or to approach a regional research council or something like that. So there are ways to do this. But in the end, I think uh, it is just as much a top-down question as it is a bottom-up change movement. So you want to change things, I suppose, if I understand you correctly, bottom-up, whereas um, the challenge, also as I have experienced it in Africa, uh, or on the African continent, to be at least a bit more precise, um, was just as much a policy implementation question as it was um, a research drive question from the scientific community. So um, the first question to me would be, are the funding bodies, are the research policy, the science policy makers in their mindset convinced that this is a thing, that this is something that we should be doing? And I would love to see it because I had the privilege to, to, to experience firsthand in different parts um, of, of the African continent um, the pressures that are on the social systems, which are, if we're honest, much, much higher than there are in the privileged um, global north. Um, so you experience pressures which, for example, also applied science could immediately tackle when it comes to water management, when it comes to agricultural um, research and so on. Um, so I think the pressures are there to drive RI actually much, much stronger than it's probably possible in the more, let's say, lean back, um, independent cultures of science as we're experiencing them in, in Europe, in, in many of the European countries at least. So I would see that as an opportunity, as long as policymakers are aware of that and are also willing to drive that change from a political point of view. I'm not sure if that answer helps because you were explicitly asking for capacity uh, building, I think, but I would, I would wonder whether the one thing comes first. Does anyone want to add to that or disagree? <laughs> If I may ask another question to the audience, um, uh, I'm curious about how people react to uh, translating RRI into a broader research ethics. So, uh, so now we have kind of three strands of furthering RRI uh, in Horizon Europe. So it's about op open science. Um, cooperation and also research ethics. Uh, would you, can, if I can ask Renee, would you say that there is a common understanding in, in the DG research and innovation about responsibility or RI or how, how um, what is the dialogue, internal dialogue? We have Ron here. Okay. Oh. Um, I, I, if Rene wants to respond first, that, uh, that's okay by me. Uh, he has unmuted his mic, so Rene, feel free to okay. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, no, I, I had the feeling that the question was addressed to me, so sorry if I take the floor. It's, uh, but yeah, so I'm not sure if uh, if there is a shared diagnosis in uh, DZ research. You know this. Um, um, you know the. I I think in your pre. I mean maybe I should come back to your presentation, Ellen Marie. I think what you presented at the end at your conclusions on uh, on RRI. I think. You, uh, you know, I think it's a fair representation of the reality as far as I can see. So there is not, I, I think you, you did there a good job. That's, that's a fair representation. Um, you know, what uh, differentiates us is um, not um, all think what's good to do, but, uh, you know, more from um, what do from my side and what you can do from your side mm -hmm. and of course I look to things like um, the missions or the Green Deal for example 
uh, I mentioned this in the interview, but I think it was just a few days ago that I opened a call for one billion euro. I mean, you, you, I, I don't. This is this is this is a fact. There's one billion euro for green deal research, and a large part also goes to citizen engagement and uh, knowledge strengths. It's a great opportunity mm -hmm. for the RI community to get mobilized and join in there, because you know this is maybe where we may have a slight. Uh, uh, disagreement of opinion. I'm, I'm not sure actually, I can test it out. But um, I think the weakness of SWAFs was actually that, uh, as I said in the interview, we did not deliver on outcomes. And, um, you know, my interest is really to make innovation directional. And the Green Deal is an example of that, of course. And these things which have been donated with such amounts of money and such a scale as never practiced before, if this not is populated with the RRI community, it would be a shame. Mm -hmm. And so this is your opportunity. And this is why, and of course, the quality of these things always depend on actors and who will participate and who will win the call. And you can have also a bad RRI project. You, can, you, know, you, you know these things. So it, it, as a programmer, you cannot do more than setting the conditions and ho ho and hope for the best in terms of who will show up and who will win the win the win the cash. <laughs> and now there is so much money available. People always complain there is too little, but there is so much available. You know, and and there is something where we can deliver. So uh, this also answers a little bit of question, you know, why uh, there is not so much uh, money for doing a reflection on RRI. I mean, I must say that there were quite a lot of projects. I mean, SWAFs, even if it was a small program, had a lot of projects, which uh, they all started from scratch trying to redefine what responsible research and innovation is. And I, I, I personally didn't find it very productive. Um, so that element. So if you ask me, you know, personally, I don't feel the need um, to, to further reflect on what RRI is. Uh, uh, my need is more on how to deliver on, on and especially, of course, social politically on, on this transition to an innovation paradigm, which makes the ethics will then come automatically in. So you, I think you work a little bit more. You look to concrete ethical examples and you look to the codes of conduct and so on. I will not say that these are not important. They are, of course, important, but they themselves are the result of so long. I mean, the European Code of Conduct, uh, which is reflected in the multiple uh, in, the, in the grand agreements, is is the result of 20 years long process uh, from academia and, and things, and they quarrel with each other. And in the end, uh, this is what they get, and it's from our perspective probably insufficient but this is how far it can get. Uh, so I'm more like, you know, in Holland, they say in Holland, I'm a Dutch, they say you have to roll with the pedals you have. So this is, these are the pedals. And um, so we have to exploit them. And with open science, we go beyond these research uh, ethics code, because I think a lot of uh, issues around the reproducibility of data, for example, and the reliability of scientific information should be part of uh, research ethics, which is not in there, but which we will try to address with, mm -hmm. with open science. Um, so there is still some work uh, there to do. Mm. So there is some capacities. Uh, there will be some research on error, I do. Uh, and I also agree, actually, you know, the, 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 your, your, um, you have raised this repetitively, the need for such an hub. Uh, I, I think this is actually a really good idea. And I hope um, some way or another we will um, we will able to do that. Um, uh, the sooner the better, of course. Uh, um, but of course, there we have to find this on us or about the money and see how far we can get. But it's, it's, it is on our radar. And... Um, so, yeah, sorry, I talked too long again, huh? I shut up. Ron, maybe you would like to add something? Um, yes, indeed. Um, I, 
Rani, as usual, has raised so many other additional points that it's difficult to know where, where to enter this. I have to apologise, I couldn't hear the first session this morning and I had other appointments yesterday. So if what I want to say uh, has been covered, I apologise in advance, but I'm sure these are issues that need to be readdressed. And in terms of what Alex and, and uh, Ellen Marie said, uh, and also Lucy's point, um, it seems to me that there are some additional concerns that we have to have in mind. Uh, Rennie's uh, most important point was the paradigm is more important than the abstract concept. Um, now, I, I have to admit that uh, in order to ensure that the project that I'm involved with, um, primarily at the moment, Progress, uh, we, we wrote RRI into the project. The project's about research ethics and integrity. But if we hadn't written RRI into it, I don't doubt we would have got the brilliant score that we did get from the evaluator, right? So there are some lessons that the culture has, uh, to some extent, been incorporated. However, what concerns me more than anything else is, uh, for want of a better term, and this is with respect to all of your um, work and the cluster projects involved, it's RRI evangelism. If it becomes a missionary and loses sight of the elements of the concept, then it's going to be awfully hard to achieve. And one of the dangers is that it becomes tokenist. You know, from my experience in research ethics, you often end up with people um, you know, aligning to the Oviedo Convention, uh, declaring that they support Helsinki, or that they align with human rights. You know, what does it mean unless you look at the context in which those things are actually practiced in the field? And this is where Lucy's point is relevant, because as you move between different contexts, you know, you see different things being uh, possible. So um, I'd be less concerned, let's say, than uh, Ellen Marie, about actually having the name RRI in uh, Horizon Europe, I would, uh, as long as the elements to what you um, see to be important in RRI, the lessons that have been learned, the elements of the culture that need to be developed, if they are in Horizon Europe, then let's not be precious about the term. There's an American proposals and applications, they all mention R RCR, but I don't know if they really, when in the field, in the lab or wherever, are actually practicing RCR, uh, it's only what they tell me or what gets um, disclosed in, in, you know, in the event and the outcomes. And the, other, the final point that I want to make about this is that we've been doing some interviews. Uh, you know, the, my project, ProRes, is about actually trying to get um, policymakers to look at the nature of the evidence that they use, not just used ideologically biased evidence, but look at ethically produced and ethically generated evidence, which essentially should be what RRI has achieved, they should look at that and that's the evidence they should use for making their policies. Now they don't do that. In some countries they do it less than in others. <laughs> and in some places it's evident that they don't look at the real evidence. That, you know, they just use the evidence that supports their particular ide ideological view. So that's, that's my concern. How do you make sure that when, you know, the true elements of the culture, all the things that we are all seeking, I know, there's no real difference if you look at the term, you know, the, the, the underlying elements within the paradigm, we're, at, we're actually after people being honest, being transparent, behaving res responsibly. All of these things mean very different and, you know, difficult to, to actually define and conceptualize terms. And the, the danger is that if you just simply promote a particular term like RRI, it gets siloed. It gets ghettoized. It becomes easy for people to say, oh, RRI was a fashion. We're on to something else now. Uh, now, uh, you know, that is a real danger, I think. You lose sight of what you're really after when you're trying to achieve it. And the final thing I'd say, when we actually interviewed, we've interviewed researchers, we've interviewed uh, you know, research funders, we've interviewed uh, policymakers and policy advisors, and about... 50% uh, of them, when we asked the question, do you know what RRI is? Do you understand it? 50% of them said no, uh, never heard of it. That's an interesting response. We then explained what it was and they said, well, that's obvious, isn't it? We should be doing that, shouldn't we? And then the others who knew about it had a range of different kind of interpretations of what RRI actually meant to them and just how achievable it was. And again, that's where I saw most of the tokenism. Oh yes, I know what it's about.
we do that. So, um, you know, I, I, what I'm doing here is what the Commission really loves, and that's disruption, right? They love disruptive technologies. And we need to talk about interoperability. In other words, how across all the cluster of RRI projects, research integrity, research ethics projects, what are the common elements that we can promote via Horizon Europe? That's the more important thing than, if you like, the missionary label. I hope I've not offended anybody. Well, there will be so many things to do, but the session is more or less over. So I give a quick answer from Helen Marie to Helen Marie and Alex. And the very last question, if we have some other, some other. Okay, oh, well, thank you, Ron. I think there is some value in the concept as well, because I think that there are a lot of organizations that are out there trying to do RRI. And if they see that it's gone, they might, you know, get confused or stop doing it or whatever, feel that it wasn't worth it. Uh, so I think there is a value in it. And I think that it's a value in it also because um, other concepts that can be used are, re are, there's, are um, often reduced in a way that RI is supposed not to be reduced because it is supposed to be this integrated, more holistic philosophy. So I think I'm afraid that that will disappear. But um, otherwise, I mean, yeah, it's a discussion. <laughs> so I think I think it was maybe Rene and Lyndon who said it, that you have to see it. different concepts are uh, different instruments on the way to to responsibility, and and then that and I would agree with that. Alex. Yeah, I mean, in general, it being a fashion doesn't necessarily need to be a bad thing if you want. Um, looking, looking at the at the guitars behind you, you know there there is there are certain trends in music, and if you play the right music, the right tune at the right time, that can be a really good opportunity. But I see, I, I totally agree that I see the risk for yeah the risk <laughs> the risk for tokenistic uh, understandings of it and it becoming a checkbox activity. And I think actually, to be quite honest, this is already happening while we speak. Um, however. The question what to do and why to do it, which is that policy, philosophical, ethical um, discourse that we've now had for, I think, way too long, uh, leaves the question open to me how to do it. And there are a lot of answers that our community has delivered and that even outside of the Swaths bubble, other um, communities have delivered also beyond the EU, indeed, like in, from in the US and uh, also in Africa and other countries where we've um, dealt in. But that, to me, and that's what, what Elmarie uh, uh, emphasized earlier, it must be written into the work programs. If you leave it vaguely and abstractly in there, then people don't really know what's expected and how they're supposed to do it. That's the first element. And the second one, um, it, it must also be facilitated and fostered with very tangible, pragmatically practical support mechanisms, talking of the hub and capacity building, for the mechanical engineers and the uh, synthetic um, um, biotechnicians and whatever, yeah, people who have maybe, as you said, not even heard of the concept, but even if they have, they don't know how to do it. How do you, how do you co-create with civil society organizations upstream? Well, let's have a guess, let's Google it. Yeah? No, there are, there are tried, tried and tested ways to do it. And that knowledge transfer needs to happen more in a more institutionalized way than I think it's being foreseen at the moment. And if we don't do that, we run exactly the risk of what Ron has just erased. It becomes tokenistic. There's a risk of it becoming a checkbox activity and that we might lose more um, than we have gained in the last few years. So I'm actually quite, quite concerned, to be honest. Okay, thanks Alex as well. Well, if we don't have any other question, it seems that, well, the chat is like, Great. I would like to thank you so much for being here in this panel session. And just a quick uh, like spot. Pedro is sharing the screen. In like 10 minutes, uh, or maybe less than 10 minutes, we will have this interactive, interactive sessions where we will present our guidelines for governance and we will try to have some like interactions with the audience, especially in terms of how to mainstream how to in the European research area. And now we can move 
as we started saying from the first day, from a concept of RRI, which is beautiful and romantic somehow, to one which is useful. So how can we really, we can really invest on the usefulness of this concept so that, and this is linked to what, with what we were saying, it could become really an operational concept for our program and now it could become useful also in Green Deal and all the other initiatives that Horizon Europe is launching. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Thank Alex, you. thanks to Ellen. And see you soon. <laughs> and thanks to everyone for participating. Uh, Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Thank you. So the link for the, the next session is in the, in the chat in and the is the correct one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, don't be lost. Uh, just copy paste, and then you can access the, the session, uh, and um, and we will start uh, on time. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.